According to the Washington Post uh, database, 62 people have been fatally shot by police in the United States since September 1st, and 706 since the beginning of the year. 46% of them white, 25% African American, and 16% Hispanic, with no data on the rest. This has been an issue in Canada as well. Many will remember two of the highest profile cases in Toronto, those of Sami Yatim and Andrew Loku. Our purpose tonight is not to address individual cases, but to address issues related to investigation of police shootings, such as, does the public have a right to know about the investigations? If there is a right, how broad and far-reaching is it? Should this right also apply to systemic issues, or should it apply to matters of individual conduct that may lead to discipline or uh, termination? Do police officers have the same rights as ordinary people when their actions have led to serious harm to a member of the public? And what reports are we talking about? In Ontario, is it only reports of the investigations by the Special Investigations Units, the SIU, or to all reports concerning police officer conduct, whether by an external agency or the police service itself? We have assembled a remarkable panel to address these issues tonight uh, and to have a discussion amongst themselves and with you uh, about each of them. As we know, freedom of information is a cornerstone of our democracy, and yet, Information really isn't that free. We have to fight for it every day. As journalists, we have to fight for it. As citizens, we have to fight for it. And there are reasons why there are limits that are put on this freedom of information. And these are some of the things that we can talk about today. Are When there are limits being put on this freedom of information, does what suffers in the process? Is it accountability? Is it the transparency? Is it our, our respect for some of these public institutions? Clearly, as, as Jim was mentioning, this is a timely topic because we're seeing some of the issues. As the public says, it has a greater right to know. It really does seem to be this idea of, uh, and I know, Joanne, you don't like the term secrecy, but uh, it is privacy. We're talking about protection. We're talking about protection of police officers, and yet Pascal is talking about the protection of the public. Mm -hmm. It's the protection of the police or the protection of the police. And it seems to be that this is where we're getting uh, uh, the real conflict and real friction. And there is a public perception that the, the, the protection of the police is coming at the expense of the release of information. So, Joanne, I know you're taking issue with this idea of why the secrecy, but do you argue that special measures have to be taken in to protect information about um, not only identities of the police, what they're doing out in the field, is that information, should that information be withheld, as it was in the case of Andrew Locke, we don't want to get into individual cases, but what really enraged a lot of people in the public when the SIU report came out that it was highly redacted, most of the information, and there was some question as to whether it needed to be that, uh, the information needed to be that highly redacted. Would you argue in this kind of in these kinds of reports that you do have to uh, take a lot of that information out, that that's not information that should be shared with the public? Yes, because, you know, Let's forget about LOKU, but one has to remember in terms of LOKU, a lot of this respectfully is a red herring. There will be a mandatory inquest, so a lot of this evidence is going to be tested, and it's important not to taint future proceedings. It's important not to um, intimidate um, prospective witnesses in the future or in a case, because that's a concern in terms of cooperation with the SIU by civilians. Um, cooperation with the police in terms of having their um, personal identifiers protected and it's it's also important for um, police officers you've gone through an investigation it is an independent agency it's completely separate from the police and I don't agree respectfully with the clearance rate or the immunity there's lots of charges you can go on the website there's a lot of charges so they've gone through an investigation, they've been cleared, and does the police service issue investigative reports on citizens when they clear them? No. Does the police service issue the names of citizens they've investigated and cleared? No. And there is a presumption of innocence for police officers. So this is being thoroughly investigated by an independent <coughs> agency. Uh, there should be some consideration of privacy. 
David, I want you to pick up on that as well. And, and, and when it comes to determining these lines, you were starting to sort of outline, uh, outline the kind of information that, you know, where, where you try to draw that line. But I wonder, how do you see the dangers and the consequences of, of when there is at least to be a perceived lack of transparency in public agencies like police forces? In terms of the consequences, uh, you know, we live in a society where we expect openness, we expect transparency, and I think that's heightened when it comes to public officials, and, even, and heightened even more when it comes to police who have extraordinary powers. So um, you talk about a presumption, we talk about a presumption. I think part of the problem here is there should be a presumption of openness rather than a presumption of, uh, of confidentiality. So the, the starting point should be, we're entitled to see these records. Um, unless there's a, a good, strong, compelling reason to withhold the records or withhold part of the records. So in other words, we're entitled to it. Uh, can you show that some of the information, if released, would prejudice up the right to a fair trial? Okay, we'll consider that. But, if, but to say that, well, we can't disclose the whole report because it could uh, you know, prejudice the right to a fair trial. Maybe so, but maybe not. And we, uh, my point is you need to test that and you need to go through the report uh, line by line, word by word if necessary, and really think through whether is this actually going to uh, prejudice a fair trial, uh, somehow upset a coroner's inquest. I think we need to be skeptical about that, and I think there needs to be proof or a, a reasonable expectation of harm, rather than just a simple, if it's disclosed, it's going to it's going to cause this prejudice, it's going to un unduly invade privacy. There needs to be proof. Julian, in your experience, and, and, and you emphasize that experience, do you find that when you are pressing for the details uh, of information, details uh, about what was happening in the field, is there a reluctance to release that information because it becomes a sort of blanket immunity that we can't release this information because it'll, whether it's preju prejudicing a right to a fair trial or, or other considerations that are thrown in there, does it become more difficult for you and do you see that that's often the knee-jerk reaction? which is to say, no, you can't get that information. So the way I would describe it is this way. Um, like many areas of, uh, of uh, uh, professional occupations, you develop experience and expertise at ascertaining information you need to do your job. And it's not just lawyers, it's there's, you know, you all are good at something, you do very well, you've figured out ways to cut corners and get good work done. In our field, the gathering of facts is essential to making a proper case, not just uh, allegations, but a proper case. The gathering of those facts is hampered by an extraordinary government machinery that is terrified of the police. So politicians are afraid of the police. Mm -hmm. Politicians generally follow the public. They don't lead the public. So what happens is in LOCU, and as a result of LOCU, you folks generated change. The politicians, what did they do? Well, it's right in the manual. I can look it up. Oh, I'll order an inquiry. Justice Tulloch, right? And the entire process is somewhat absurd because at least seven, that might be Justice Tulloch, Peter, um, <laughs> at least seven or eight inquiries have already said SIU reports should be public, dating back to the 90s. Justice Adams repeated it three, or three times, I think. Uh, it's been repeated over and over again. The public screamed loud enough, the politicians were afraid enough, so that they drove change. That's what drives change. But I would like to point something out. As we're engaged in this bizarre sort of, in this navel gazing, the Supreme Court of Canada has already said, as a matter of law, permitting police officers, right, to consult with counsel before their notes are prepared is an anathema to the very transparency that the legislative scheme aims to promote. Transparency that the act aims to promote. Put simply, appearances matter. And when the communities trust in the police is at stake, it is imperative that the investigatory process be and appear to be transparent. You folks are debating something that's already a matter of law, yet the police have us so wrapped up and so terrified of our own shadows, right, that black letter law, according to the Supreme Court candidate, isn't good enough to get this stuff released. We need another inquiry. At the same time, and I want to balance some of the issues Joanne raised, uh, she may not believe this, but I actually put a lot of stock in what you say. And as an example, there are things that don't need t disclosure. And by the way, families who don't all necessarily want full disclosure. So there's a privacy issue that you have to protect. Not because somebody's a police officer, in fact, that's the public piece, but because 
as an example. There might be uh, medical records referred to that a family doesn't want to disclose. There might be redactions necessary to uh, protect privacy issues that have nothing to do with investigating the incident. So it doesn't mean reports should go unredacted. But, and there's a final point, and I have to, Pascal, I have to tell you the truth. Numbers mean squat. If they prosecute 20% of police officers next year, I won't be happy if they were trying to meet a quota you gave for them. Uh -huh. I don't think that's the way we want our investigators working according to quotas, either high or low. I don't want to hear that an SIU investigator didn't lay a series of charges because they charged too many this year or too little. What we need to look at is the quality of the work they do, right? which is very different, and whether they're set up for failure. My worry is they continue to be set up for failure because the police, in essence, right, enjoy this block. Every time we grow, we get blocked. So now we've been blocked on the release of these reports. They need to be released. It needs to be transparent. Pascal, let's talk about the, um, that report that was released, the SIU report, the investigation, Andrew Locke. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of it, and, and perhaps some of you folks saw this as well, a lot of the information was withheld, it was redacted. What, uh, there are some legal reasons that will be presented. David can outline why some of that information would be redacted. But when you see the amount of information that was withheld, what does that suggest to you? That they have something to hide. That they have something to hide. I think the most alarming thing about all of this is that if something, if, if we're, if one of us, specifically if it was a black person that were to commit crime, you would hear everything about their life story. You would know their mama's life story. You would know everything about them, right? But you can't hear anything about someone that committed a crime, right? And moreover, these families are being told to wait. Andrew Loku's family was told to wait for months, okay? For eight months, for eight months, they were told to wait for answers. And they didn't get any answers. They just had to slap a piece of paper, slap it down in front of them, which told them that nothing would happen, nothing would be brought to justice for, for Andrew Loku. Right? It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, when Andrew Loku, not Andrew Loku, sorry, when Jermaine Carby got murdered, one of the first things that the media reported, and I'm also pointing out to journalists in the room right now, one of the first things that journalists pointed out was how he had a criminal history, how he was known to crime, quote unquote, right? All of this gets dug up because he was murdered, he was murdered, right? But we can't know, we can't know a police officer killing somebody, we can't know that a police officer killed somebody and went back to work, we can't know that a police officer killed somebody and still got a paycheck at the end of the week, right? It's ridiculous. You want to jump in on that one, John? Sure. Was, I just I saw you taking notes frantically. So you probably had a couple of points you wanted to make. In terms of the disclosure about the criminal history, you can criticize the courts, Pascal. The media goes to the courthouse, they go to the clerk, and they say, provide us the criminal record history. You can't criticize the police on that. The police have really strict restrictions in terms of oath of secrecy and information about criminal records. So that criticism you can lay at the courthouse. And in terms of the criticism of the, of the length of the report being released, that's a concern of everybody in terms of the public, the families, the police. There's a real concern out there that investigations are being finished in one to two to three months and uh, it takes 24 months, 12 months, whatever. It's hard for everybody, and I understand that. And in terms of, you know, the family got a piece of paper, that's different than a press release. Maybe that's a personal criticism between the family and the SIU, but that should not determine what gets released publicly. Because what's noteworthy? You know, Julian keeps mentioning Wood and Schaefer. That information about the notebooks was right there in the press release. So a lot of information, the public, the media, civil counsel used is found. But you folks it. criticized Scott for doing that. You folks at the time, including, with all due respect, you, Alok, criticized the director of SIU for going public. You mounted a huge campaign against him. I was there. I was a co-applicant right through the courts, and you folks were all over him for going public. Do not tell me that that case reflects an example of transparency. That reflects an example of courage by a director who actually had it taken out on him on his occupation. That is complete nonsense that he was supposed to do that. Same with Marin. When these folks go public and they drive change, it is not with any of your encouragement. It is at the point, literally, of losing their jobs. So I, I just want to emphasize, that's what happened. Scott got pummeled for going public. 
and he drove change. And what happens is when you bring transparency to police misconduct, there is a price to be paid, there's a consequence. Nobody pats you on the back from the police side or for government and says, we understand you're just doing their job. That does not happen. I guess we'll disagree about that. I was because, there and well, lived it, so well, I saw it. In terms of the criticism in the past, the SIU mandate is about criminal investigations. Is there reasonable grounds? And there was criticism of um, prior directors that they got into issues that went beyond did the officer, was the officer justified in shooting? Did the officer commit the sexual assault? They got into policy and procedure issues that went way beyond their mandate. I want to know from you, David, the, the idea, the word entitled is, is you say, we are entitled to know. And, you know, how much are we entitled to know? Because we in the public feel we're entitled to know everything. And, and it's like the, 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 the great Jack Nicholson line from A Few Good Men that you can't handle the truth. You know, this idea that sometimes this information has to be withheld uh, to protect reputations, to protect a, a number of things. So, like, what is your feeling it, 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 that how much we are entitled as a public when there are people like Pascal who are out there on the streets demanding information? So, I agree with the premise, and we have it, it's enshrined in our law that we are entitled but uh, we live in a society that's, that's balanced and fair, and uh, transparency is, is, is critically important. It has even constitutional dimensions. However, the right to privacy is also critically important and must be considered in the mix. So we cannot simply sweep aside the right to privacy uh, in, uh, in the name of transparency. So we have that right. Uh, individuals do have a right of privacy, I think when it comes, as I said, when it comes to public officials, that right of privacy is diminished, uh, but it's, it doesn't disappear. So we, we have to take that into account. Uh, we also have to take into account we are, we are a society that has uh, fair and just processes. Our, our administration of justice in the courts and the tribunals is fair and balanced, and we have to ensure that people who are, who are subject to allegations receive a fair trial. So, these are, are also constitutional principles that have to be respected. So of course, the right of transparency is not absolute, but it's pretty powerful when it comes to uh, allegations of uh, misconduct in law enforcement uh, officials. One of the stories <coughs> I'm currently working on for our, our upcoming season of the Fifth Estate is dealing with police body cameras. And police body cameras are now being worn by the vast majority of police forces in the United States. Uh, Toronto's now indicated this summer that they're, they're opting to, uh, to go forward with the program of, of arming their officers with these body cameras. The intention of these, or at least the, what the, the thought behind it was, this is going to increase police accountability. This is going to increase transparency. This is going to empower public with more information about what happened when there's a face-to-face -face incident between a police officer and someone in the, in the public. Uh, and yet, there have been some cases where the police have refused to actually make that information public. Um, and that's a bit of the, the push and pull. And, and I wonder, Joanne, from your experience and from your you know, contacts in, in police, uh, with police officers, do they feel that they, a, a real reluctance to open up their world, their cases, uh, the, the scenarios of what happened on the, on, on the street or in an incident, do they have a natural reluctance to protect that information because they fear it could be damaging? I, I don't think so. Like the example of body cameras, um, the Toronto Police Service have in-car cameras. They've been wonderful in terms of for police, for accused persons, for the public. But there is also, and tied in, you know, privacy concerns. And like an example with the body cameras, what ends up happening to the record? Because an officer goes into a home for a domestic violence, and there are things there that the public shouldn't see. So there always has to be a balancing of privacy. But do you think that the police officers deserve a, a, a special sort of, they get special protection as opposed to what anyone else in the public no, I don't think so. Um, anyone else in the public has uh, no requirement or no duty to cooperate. Nobody else in the public has a duty to make notes immediately. Everybody can make a choice whether or not they speak to the police. So I don't think the police have 
you know, special protections. And one thing that has been a concern uh, for some of the police with respect to body cameras and that is it's a tool to use, but often they're not given an opportunity to even look at the tool. And then later on, you know, a year later when something comes to court, it becomes a memory contest between what their observations were and what's on the video. And they oftentimes either haven't had the time or are prohibited from looking at the video and they see the video for the first time in court. The, the SIU, and, and as we know, Pascal's feelings about that, but Julian, I'm curious about yours as well. I mean, if this was uh, originally established as something that was supposed to, to, to build, or rebuild public confidence in, uh, in police investigations. Do you feel it has actually accomplished that? I think like many uh, institutions of its nature, and I think of right now the OIPRD, I mean, how many people in this room knows what that stands for? Honestly. That, and, and, right? And, that, and this is an informed public, right? <laughs> the truth of the matter is a lot of these institutions are set up for failure. And so they, they limp along, and it was actually uh, the Harris government, uh, through Charles Harnick, who uh, in the uh, mid-90s, finally, uh, uh, mid to late 90s, finally started uh, resourcing SIU, creating a proper building, creating facilities, a proper uh, forensic examination uh, set up and equipment. And, and I'm answering your question, and it's more to this point. If you set them up for success, they will succeed. If you create enough barriers, right, then, um, you know, what Pascal is saying makes sense. But Pascal, this is my true feeling. And please understand, this comes from someone who in 2008, when I thought SIU had gone corrupt because there were so many retired police officers running that place, in a speech to the Criminal Lawyers Association, I went public and said I thought it was corrupt. They're not corrupt right now. That's my opinion. I could be wrong, not infallible, but my, my experience is they're not corrupt. That's not where they're stuck. They're set up for failure. And what's interesting is no other area is plagued with the inability to follow the law. So we have a Supreme Court of Canada judgment called Schaefer Minty. It actually says, in short, so long as police officers choose to wear the badge, they must comply with their duties and responsibilities under the regulation, even if this means at times having to forego liberties they would otherwise enjoy as ordinary citizens. It's all sitting there. It's the Supreme Court of Canada, it's the law, and it's the last five years. But we don't have bureaucrats who are following this. It didn't get raised at the start of this lecture when you heard about the law. The law is clear. It's supposed to be transparency, transparency, transparency. Instead of having these political battles where we're afraid of the police, we should be invoking the law to our advantage. If we did, SIU would be empowered, they would do better work, you would have more confidence in them. I accept, I accept that there is a crisis here, but the crisis is not, in my view, with SIU. The crisis is we're afraid of our own shadows when it comes to the police. We are. We're terrified. Listen, I get scared when I get pulled over or something, not that I've ever been pulled over, but I get, I get frightened. I do, you, you feel your everything, your whole metabolism goes straight up. They make us nervous. And so it's a challenge to keep it under control. So it, in, in, my instinct is, if people want to drive change, start asking and requiring the politicians to make the changes and stand up to police. That's, that's what's missing. And as for this whole notion of we're a beleaguered group, give me a break. First of all, if it's true, and it is very true that the oversight is extensive in Ontario, if it's true, it's been now going on for decades, hasn't stopped recruitment. Officers by the droves want these jobs with the paid duty that pay well over 100, 150,000 with paid duty, right? People want the work. The Toronto police aren't having trouble finding officers with all this incredible oversight apparatus. They still want the work. People know what's involved in the work. They still want the jobs. Why? Because it's an attractive, very, very hard, by the way. I wouldn't have the courage to do the work, so I'm not going to pretend it's not hard. It's very hard. But don't do the woe is me. It, the judgment says if you want to wear the badge and do the job, right, follow the law. That's it. That's what we need to require them to do, but we don't. We're afraid of our own shadows, and that's what I personally believe is the problem. Our fear within ourselves to drive change. Well, and one of the problems I would suggest as well are the perceptions and the perceptions of people like uh, Pascal as well, because those perceptions can become uh, a reality, certainly when they're reinforced, that there is, that you feel uh, a mistrust, you feel a, a lack of confidence in a critical 
um, institution like the SIU. And I, so I wonder, for, you know, are you being at all reassured uh, about um, the fact that there is more information out there than perhaps you believe? No, not at all. Um, I also wanted to address when you I, I had a hunch you were going to say that. <laughs> I wanted to address what you were saying. Like, I, I, I wasn't talking only about the SIU. I drew on the SIU because um, I kind of wanted to distinguish it a little bit um, and talk specifically about them. But it's a problem um, largely with the Toronto police. And I lumped SIU in with them because a lot of them are retired police officers. Um, that is, is, is beyond um, just a band-aid solution like body cameras. Though I think it is an amazing solution, um, it is a band-aid solution. It's not gonna solve the problem, the fact that there is a racism problem within the police force. We can't pretend like that's not a massive elephant that's sitting in the board meetings or within the police force. Um, body cameras um, are, 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 are great, but how many how many of us have seen videos of be people being killed um, and watching the videos off of people's body cameras? I've seen those videos, and yes, nothing still happens to those officers because there hasn't been an assumption or a realization, um, or or you know, actually pointing out that it's it's bigger than an individual case, it's bigger than an individual um, police officer, but rather a problem that's existing within the entire police force. Um, I don't really remember the question. Ask me. I'm sorry. Um, um, there was just an attempt to reassure you there was actually more information available that there wasn't that the, the, this you know, that this closing of the ranks to withhold that information. But, but I, your perception would certainly seem to suggest otherwise. Absolutely not. Like I don't I don't think so. Especially when there are um families of, of so many, so many victims that don't actually know what happened or how the their loved one got killed, right? Yes, there quote unquote may be more information than past generations or in this different province or whatever, but the end of the line is it's not enough. It is not enough. We can sit here and try to praise ourselves as, you know, being the leading um, people within this country or whatever. But at the end of the day, there are still so many families that actually don't know what happened to their loved ones, and that's something that needs to be addressed, and that's something that needs to be that needs to be known. David, do you have, and I don't need you to name a specific police force, but have you had a history of difficulty in trying to get information from within police forces? We, we respond to access to information requests to police forces. Um, I, you know, I won't say that police forces are not cooperative. They, they follow the law when it comes to uh, the FOI laws. Uh, I think a big part of the problem here for police services, to be fair to them, and, and for the SIU, is the law could be clear. Particularly, and I'm focusing on the SIU now, uh, you know, Julian said, well, the law is clear, there needs to be transparency. I disagree with that. The law is not clear. The law could be clear. Um, FIPA is great. FIPA tells us a lot. There's some. It gives us some guidance. But I think that what we need here is law reform, and we need uh, the Police Services Act to be reformed. Uh, that's what we told Justice Tullock. Uh, and we need somebody. We need the great minds to address this problem. And uh, as I said, enshrine uh, a right of access. We have a right of access to these types of records with specific exceptions. And I think that will put police, it'll put uh, SIU in a better position to follow the law and, and strike a better balance, ensure more transparency, while also protecting vitally important interests of privacy and rights to a fair trial.